you kind of get to that point where you say, you know what, you have to be true to yourself. You got to be true to yourself as an individual, you know, your faith um, and just kind of you, know, you being a leader, both for yourself, your family, but ultimately your community. Welcome to the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast, the place where we help entrepreneurs to not hate their boss. Our mission is to end entrepreneurial unhappiness. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. My name is Robert Peterson, former passer turned CEO and the smiling coach. I believe that success without happiness is failing, but there is hope. Join us each week as we bring you an inspiring leader or message to help you. Thanks for investing time with us today. Our guest today is an expert in digital marketing, business development, and customer acquisition. Justin Croxton is the CEO of Propellant Media. He's an accomplished entrepreneur and advisor with over 17 years of success in the marketing and advertising, real estate, and retail industries. Justin Croxton teaches Robert about geofencing and the power of SEO and targeting for lead generation. He helps companies find leads who participate in events, visit certain locations, or are looking for your product or service. Using the technology available like geofencing, Justin takes digital marketing and lead generation to another level. If you're an entrepreneur who started their business with a purpose and a passion that has been lost in the busyness of the daily grind, we get it. That is why we've opened up our free strategy calls. A lot of entrepreneurs, probably including you, just want a sense of clarity on the barriers holding them back that you need to overcome in order to accelerate your growth and achieve your dreams. These short 30-minute calls give you a chance to work with one of our coaches without any commitment or pressure. Scheduling is easy. Just go to smilingcall.com. Let's jump on a call and get you the help and clarity you need. Select a time and let's build your business. It's time for you to add value. Mm -hmm. Well, Justin, thank you so much for joining me today. Just looking forward to, uh, man, learning some things about marketing and learning you know, about your journey as well. Yeah, me too. I definitely appreciate it, Robert. Absolutely. So my first question is always, you know, just tell us about your own entrepreneurial journey and usually use that as a jumping off point for uh, our discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I graduated from uh, business school um, up in New York in about 2013, roughly. And I always knew I wanted to, I didn't always know, but I saw that there was an opportunity for me to work in digital marketing, just the idea or the opportunity of knowing that I can have clients all around the country, let alone the world, and not like segmented to one particular city uh, was, was sort of a pretty fascinating um, and intriguing opportunity. I was like, all right, I got to take advantage of this. So I actually have had a couple different companies. The first was Q Commerce, which is sort of like my own individual digital consulting practice. I was doing SEO paid search for like small, mid-sized companies in, in the New York region, mostly. And then in 2014, my wife and I moved back to Atlanta. But around that same time, I also started an e-commerce brand called Barbrat. You know, it was an Amazon e-commerce brand, you know, you know, multi seven figures doing really well. And then it wasn't until 2015 where I saw that there was an even bigger opportunity to start this agency um, where we really focus primarily on geofencing advertising, OTT advertising, essentially. And, and the rest is history. Um, that's kind of really been my focus over the last you know, three, you know, three, what am I talking about? Uh, five, six plus years, essentially. And it's been good. It's been a good time since then. All right. So I, I need to know what, why, why you chose your company name and, and what's a little bit of background about the company itself and, 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 and why this, why this name? Sure. I mean, it, to be honest with you, you know, our, our partners were just kind of sitting around a table and one person, we were just kind of just spitballing and we said propellant propellant media it's like okay that sounds that sounds nice <laughs> you know you got propellant it kind of fuels a company forward you know that that sounds reasonable let's let's go with that it's punchy it's it's unique um and that was i mean honestly like it wasn't any formal rhyme or reason outside of sounds good it's unique 
let's move forward with it. And that was it. And we've been running with that ever since. Nice. I, lo- I like it. I'm uh, yeah. It, I've always tried to figure out how to describe, you know, rebuilding a business or repairing a business while it's in motion. Cause you know, obviously you can't stop and it's kind of like doing rocket repair while the yeah. rocket's flying. Right. And so, so true. So, so true. I think, uh, that's kind of the connection to propellant and rocket for me was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah. It just kind of felt right. And then we all just said, well, that's what we're going to go with. <laughs> nice. And, and it's it. modern and it's, yeah, it, it definitely has, has a, has a good forward motion kind of feel. So, yeah, it has so very a, good. you mentioned, you mentioned a word that, that literally w- I've never seen or heard before reading your profile and, and preparing for the this show. And so for me, it's, and, and, and mind you, I'm, I'm, you know, a, a rookie in the entrepreneur space, couple, you know, four years, five years. And, uh, and certainly a rookie in the marketing space. So, okay. so for, yeah. for me, geofencing was like a completely new idea and, and had not heard, had not heard that term. And so can you help me understand what is, what is geofencing marketing and, and how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so geofencing advertising is the practice of serving ads to people in very, very precise areas. I mean, all the way down to the contours of the building. Wow. And the concept behind it is that in, in advertising, there are times when you don't want to target everybody within a city, let alone everybody within a particular, um, within a zip code. Like sometimes you just want to reach people at certain buildings. And the concept behind it is that your location can give me some insights into your intent to buy, right? So if you are going to a car dealership, I'd say seven to eight times out of 10, you're probably in market looking to buy a car, right? <laughs> so if I own a car dealership, I would want to geofence other car dealerships effectively. Um, let's say I am a developer. I'm a real estate developer. I have like several communities within the city of Atlanta. And I know that within my competitive set, there are all these other developments that are under construction. So if, I, if I'm a consumer and I am driving to another development that is under construction, maybe seven to eight times out of 10, I'm probably in market looking to buy a home. And mm-hmm. so what we would then do is we would geofence those other communities. Um, and what happens is within the geofencing space, you're able to capture someone's mobile device ID and in that moment, we're then able to serve ads to them when those individuals go on mobile apps and websites. Wow. So if you think about Angry Birds, Words with Friends, The Weather Channel, Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, Daily Mail, you know, it's kind of like site retargeting, but in the physical world, essentially. Wow. Not, we're not sending text messages or anything like that. It's a little bit more of a passive experience, but it does still have a, have a great impact uh, from a marketing standpoint. Um, I mean, as an agency, I mean, we also do like paid search, pay-per-click advertising, Google ads, you know, Facebook advertising, Instagram, but as an agency, this is really what we lead with as an organization. And we also usually tell people it's great to have this as part of your marketing mix, but not just the sole penicillin that's going to solve all your marketing problems per se. So it's, so it's, it's, it's like retargeting if somebody's come onto my website in the digital space, but it's actually based on their physical location. So they visited a physical location that you've tagged and, and based on them visiting that physical location, you're, you're sending them ads based on, um, on what your, um, clients are offering. Exactly. Exactly what you just said. 100%. Wow. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a whole other level. Like I've, I've, I've come to understand local SEO, especially like YouTube videos and being able to tag a YouTube video locally and, and title it with a local title that, mm-hmm. that you know, makes it like the best convention in Colorado and, and, you know, in March. And so people yeah. that search for conventions in Colorado in March, you know, it yeah. automatically is going to slide to the top and, and hit, hit yeah. you know, well in the search engine. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so, so I, true. And, and just the power of local SEO, right? I, Mm-hmm. Local SEO for service providers, especially, is it's critical. It's fairly important, right? And being able to to get a service provider to to those top spots um, mm-hmm. nationally, obviously, it's a little more challenging to to get those top spots. Keywords are are super competitive in spaces like coaching and and other yeah. business development things, but but local SEO can be can be super super powerful. Um, yeah. But this, 
geofencing sounds like it's even more specific and and and, and well, interesting. I mean, like, well, I mean, I, I think like you said, you know, like local SEO is always going to be critical to any local brick and mortar type of a location or any local business that's out there because nothing's better than reaching someone who is in in market looking to buy you know a product or service and they're doing a search and you show up organically like nothing's more powerful than that as far as i'm concerned and then geofencing you know it's it's sort of a different animal you know it's just a different way of reaching that same consumer um and you know people you know how do i say this people convert differently across different channels so don't just you know do one channel versus this channel i mean you got to try to test all of them to see kind of what's going to have the greatest impact for you and that's the best way to look at that well, I guess on the on the same side as having multiple streams of income supporting your business, having multiple channels of marketing to right. to generate leads uh, can be mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. Now, totally. obviously, you've you've grown your business uh, significantly, multiple businesses, and and lead generation is is an important piece of that. What's what's allowed you to to generate leads, and and what's really worked in in you know, generating leads as a, as a digital marketing agency? Yeah. Well, it's been a couple things. I think, number one, you know, we try to practice what we preach here at Propellant Media. So, you know, there's a lot of agencies out there that don't do any marketing and they get, they get traffic, they get, you know, a few leads here or there. But, you know, when it's time to sit down with a client, they say, hey, well, what, you know, what kind of digital marketing are you doing for yourself? And it's like, oh, not really a lot. And what, what's been great for us is we really do have sort of this testing environment to do a lot of things that we do for a lot of our clients. And, you know, the biggest thing that I like to tell folks is you, you, you have to test a lot of these different channels um, or else like you know, when you're trying to build a scalable business, you're not going to be able to do that. You know, you can't just, I mean, you can grow a business just with just one-to-one -one hand combat and blocking and tackling. But, you know, for us, we were able to build an inbound marketing engine for ourselves. I mean, we get at least, thousand leads a month um, between phone calls, you know, form submissions and whatnot. We get tons of booked appointments, you know, for our sales team. And there's been a couple of things that's really helped within that. One has been our own in inbound marketing. Two has been um, HubSpot, quite honestly. Um, HubSpot is sort of a, we're, we're a gold partner uh, with HubSpot. But, um, you know, what, what's been great with HubSpot is that the work that seven or eight people would have to do like I've been able to set it up for our company where like, I, I mean, if, if that, I mean, I probably spend maybe like 15, 30 minutes a day um, with all the different automations and triggers that we leverage um, through HubSpot as well. So that's been phenomenal, both in terms of their sales and marketing hubs. Um, but the last thing, the last two things has been us being able to differentiate ourselves and lead with geofencing. And then the second has been building a website that actually brings value to people. Can't tell you how often someone will build a website and it will be pretty thin on content. It'll just be kind of like, this is who I am. These are my services. Here's my phone number. Here's maybe a form submission on my contact page. And that's it. And you have to remember that if someone's out there looking to buy a product or a service, there are a lot of other competitors out there. So they're not just looking at you, they're looking at a lot of other people. So why should they go with you? You know, why should they have a conversation with you effectively? And, you know, what I try to tell folks is that, you know, if, if you don't feel like you have to build this behemoth of a site initially, but just always having your mindset that you're going to continue to bring more content, more information to it with the mindset that I am trying to add value to my prospect or to my customer before they actually become a customer. And that's what we do. So if you go to propellant.media, you will immediately see that, you know, like we have eBooks, we have webinars, we have tools, calculators. I mean, plus geofencing is a new topic that a lot of people don't know about. So there's like, they feel like they're learning something new, something different. And if you look at it from that perspective, take that same concept, move it over to whatever industry that you operate in, you'll be in a much better space. Um, and that's really kind of been sort of our recipe for success um, at Propellant Media. Well, it's definitely interesting, right? Because for some businesses, it, they feel like their website's just just a business card or a, or a confirmation that they exist, right? 
oh, go go see, you know, mm-hmm. my company name.com and it just means yep, you're you're real, right? But but really right. creating a website that that can actually do something. I mean, obviously there's no sense in doing local SEO if you're bringing people to a website that doesn't give them anything but a but a place to make a phone call. Yeah. It's 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 just like like small things like you know, like folks will just have a form submission on just the contact us page. Whereas I tell someone, take that same form and put it on every single page on your website. Every single wow. page, because, you know, you, you, the way that a, that people operate, sometimes they just don't submit a form because they just didn't see it or they weren't paying attention to in that moment. And you're trying to give yourself more chances to get someone's contact details so you can cultivate that relationship for your, you know, follow up email marketing, essentially, or, you know, if you're calling that person back effectively. Um, yeah, I just, you know, you know, I just, you know, see so many companies that don't think about that uh, from that perspective. Um, and it's critical. And the last thing that I'll say to that point is that, you know, for us, like I always have our link in an email or when I'm texting someone, I always have a link to our site to like really push them to our site because we also do our own site retargeting, right? Because <clears throat> people may not convert in that moment. They may convert, you know, 45 days later, you know, 17 days later, whatever that number is. And what better way to keep your site or keep your brand top of mind than number one, ensuring that you can retarget them across multiple different channels, essentially. And so there, these are small things that, you know, entrepreneurs, that mid-sized corporations can, can, can develop to ensure that they're maximizing their lead flow, essentially. Mm. Nice. So, so let's just talk about the challenge of, of growing a business to the, to the size that, that you have. And obviously you've had some really good success in e-commerce and really good success early on in, in SEO and, and local SEO. Mm-hmm. And now choosing to grow a business to the size of a propellant um you know that that scaling requires some significant planning and 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 some significant challenges would you would you share a little bit about how you what those challenges were and how you overcame them yeah you know i would say that the first two years because propellant media was founded in like late 2015 early 2016 if you will i'd say the biggest challenge was you know trying to is kind of the advice that I was giving everybody moving our mindset from a focus of hand to hand combat building relationships just through pure networking to shifting it to how am I going to build an operational model that can exist without me like I don't have to do everything there is a lot that I still do but I don't have to do everything right I have a sales team that handles you know, our sales, we have an account management team that handles, you know, client delivery execution. We have an ad ops team that handles, you know, execution of campaigns behind the scenes. You know, we have, you know, operational stuff for the company, finance, HR, things of that nature. Like, how do you get to that place? And, you know, from the 2015 to 17 timeframe, it was just, it was just slow moving, just talking to people one-on-one versus really thinking about building an infrastructure that has growth potential. And, and, and kind of honestly, just going back to it, it really came from the switch on our website, making the decision that we were going to focus on uh, geofencing. That's what we we're going to lead with to differentiate ourselves. And then like making an investment in our own marketing effectively. You know, you know, mama always says, you know, you, um, you can't uh, scared money doesn't make money ultimately you know um and we just i just kind of got to that point where i said you know what we're going to make the investment see what happens and the next thing you know we start getting leads start getting leads start getting on calls with leads start closing them move them over to our delivery ex- execution team and start going from there and so the the first first couple of years was really the biggest challenge now you know i'd say probably some of the biggest challenges is saying okay this is what our revenues are currently looking like what can I do to improve my margins? You know, so I'm adding more profit, more EBITDA uh, to my bottom line effectively. And so we're going through our entire PL. We're saying, all right, we're going to cut this, cut this. We're going to negotiate with our vendors. We're going to increase our pricing here. 
you know, we're going to increase pricing here. Yes, we may lose clients, but, you know, usually the, the, the net effect is positive because you have less clients, but you're making more margin. You can service your clients better. You know, those are some of the challenges that we're working through um, and just trying to improve, you know, across the board effectively. So you mentioned uh, that geofencing was your, your differentiator. How does how does and, and, and you mentioned a couple of ideas in that geofencing space, but how does a company knowing their niche really help in that geofencing? How you said how is the company knowing their their niche? Yeah, if if they know if, if the company you're helping or serving knows their niche really well, how does that help them in the next step when when they try to go into the the geofencing space? You know, usually, I mean, I'll, I'll say this: it, you know, geofencing isn't for everyone. You know, so I don't usually do it for like e-commerce. I don't think that's the best space for it. Um, B2B can be a little touch and go. You know, it depends on whether someone's trying to deploy more of an account based selling approach. Um, but in our experience, the very first thing, if a client knows who their target audience is, the next question they want to ask themselves is, who can I reach that is in market or closely fits my target audience, knowing that I have something that's very compelling to reach, you know, to connect with them on. But initially, how can I reach people that are within my target audience, essentially, who is in market effectively? If you're able to answer those two questions, and maybe what you do is you have like a first tranche of people that are in market, and you have a second tranche of people that may not be in market, but they fit your target audience. And then literally, we'll just go through the exercise of listing the types of places that they would want to geofence. That's, you know, places that are in market. And then people that are fit your the target audience, but they may not be in market per se. The third thing that's very critical is just because someone fits your audience doesn't mean that you know you should geofence that particular location. So, a great example: we'll have a client that comes to us; they have a product that they're looking to sell, and they know that you know women that are between the ages of like thirty and fifty-five, you know, is their target demo. And they'll say, yeah, my, my product is going to be potentially sold at Targets and Walmarts. And so I want to geofence Targets and Walmarts. It's like it's like geofencing the world. There's no there's no differentiated, you know, means of targeting your 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 ideal customer avatar. Um, and quite honestly, you know, even if you said that, you know, OK, maybe not Walmart, but, you know, maybe it really is a, a sincere location that someone like this 20, this 30 to 55 year old woman really is going to this location. There's no one else. You know, you're, you're really limiting your waste. You don't know if that person is looking for that product. <laughs> so if, if it is more of a branding exercise or a branding experience, I get that. And that that's that how it holds its place. And it's totally fine. But what we tell a lot of our clients is try to think of places where, you know, like if you're a spa, just geofence other spas, geofence like other pools, geofence, you know, places where, you know, you think that your person could have a higher propensity of being in market. If you look at it from that standpoint as a small business owner, I think you're going to put yourself in many better in a better position to drive lead flow um, and drive walk ins back to your physical location. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by Perfect Publishing, a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing carefully chooses heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You will see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. Well, I like that. I mean, it's interesting to, to think about, you know, we asked the question, where, you know, where's your ideal client hanging out? And I'd be like, well, yeah, they shop at Target or Walmart, but the problem is you can't differentiate them from the other, <laughs> all the other people that also shop yeah. at Walmart and Target. Right, so that, right. It's very, very I mean interesting. Yeah, I mean, we do have the capacity to like add some demographic variables from time to time um, within geofencing campaigns. Um, it does have a tendency to limit delivery, but if we're geofencing like a Walmart, that's when we'll do that kind of an approach. But the whole idea of geofencing is just hit people, you know, that are going to very specific locations. And ideally, it's places where that person is either in market or close to being in market, essentially. 
<clears throat> nice. Yeah. All right, Justin, let's talk a little bit about, obviously, you've built a team, and obviously, you work with a lot of clients in the, in the digital space. Um, let's talk, talk about character and, and authenticity in, in the digital space. Sure. So, so tell me how, how important is it for, for clients to be able to be authentic? And, and I know that, I mean, there's, there's a tendency, at least there's a feel, maybe, maybe it's urban legend more than, than anything, but uh, of people putting out a, a, a facade in the digital space yeah. rather than, rather than being able to just be their authentic self yeah, or authentic brand. It's, 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 it's probably one of my more favorite questions that I like to answer quite frankly. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that in terms of my own personal story. Um, so when Propellant Media was founded, you know, it's no, it's no, um, it's, it's obvious I'm black. <laughs> I'm an African-American. And when I first started Propellant Media, you know, I did have some nerves thinking that we would be accepted as an agency and we can grow at a proper clip, um, not looking at race or ethnicity or anything. And so I was nervous. I didn't, I didn't feel like I could comfortably, you know, become the face of the company. I felt like I had to just kind of be behind the scenes and put up this facade that, oh, we're this bigger company than we really are. And, you know, there's only a couple people that work here kind of thing. And, you know, there, there, there were some challenges, you know, there were a few times where we experienced, um, you know, some prejudice and, and things of that nature, but you kind of get to that point where you say, you know what, you have to be true to yourself. You got to be true to yourself as an individual, you know, your faith, um, and just kind of you, know, you being a leader, both for yourself, your family, but ultimately your community. And what I learned in the shift that I had back in 2017, as I said, you know what, I'm just going to be the face of the company. You know, I'm not not a bad speaker. You know, I have a, you know, I, I think I know this space pretty well. I can speak to a lot of these different things. And so I started doing more video, more video content, start putting more of that video out, taking that same video, putting it on our site, having it be more of a value add rather than trying to hide behind a facade. And the bigger point that people need to remember is that individuals, consumers, customers, prospects, they don't do business with companies. They do business with people. Mm. And if you remember that all of your competitors, they, you know, people go to this big site with all these links and all this stuff, but they don't really see the, the, the individual, the consumer, the human being behind the scenes. They just see this big company. I promise you, if you put yourself out there, don't worry about your voice. Don't worry about how you look. You see, like my background, it's not it's not flashy. You know, maybe I can have an office, but whatever. You know, I have we have offices here in Atlanta and Charlotte, so I'm not worried about that. But, you know, I'm just being myself. I'm on a camera. I'm having a conversation. And if you come from that space rather than I'm just going to be behind the scenes, you are going to improve your conversion rates more people are going to connect with you. You're going to, you know, feel even more and more confident in putting even more webinars, more, more audio content for your listeners, for your prospects, for people that come to your site. And it's going to help build your authority as well. It's going to show like, okay, this person really knows what they're talking about. I feel like I need to reach out to them. I can't tell you how often like, like our sales team, because with all the leads that comes in, our sales team will say, I feel like I've been talking to you forever because I've watched all your videos and all your stuff. And you probably experienced the same thing, Robert. I've watched all your stuff. I listen to all your videos. And, and then the salesperson comes in. Well, that's not really, you know, my salesperson will say, oh, that's not really, I'm not really Justin, but, you know, he's, he's right. He's, I got him on Slack if you want to you know, have a quick chat, you know, kind of thing. It really makes a difference. Don't hide behind a facade. Just be yourself. It's a lot easier to be yourself than to try to be something that you're not. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, and I think it, it's challenging. I appreciate you sharing the, the struggle, the, the reality that, that you wrestled with for yourself of putting yourself yeah. out there. And, and, and I think more people just need to hear that, you know, if, if you put a facade out there, then you're going to attract people that are attracted to the facade. And so when you interact with them, it's not going to yeah. be a true interaction. It's not going to be a true interaction. So well said, Robert, well said. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so good. I appreciate you you sharing that yeah so so i like to switch a little bit and and touch on the family side a little just because it, it's an important part and so 
you, you've had some success in business. And what's been one of the blessings of, of running your own business and raising a family? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I mean, you know, my, my father, my mother was an educator. My dad uh, was an entrepreneur. He had this sort of legal forensic photography business. Wow. So like 90% of his clients were like lawyers that, you know, there would be like a car accident or things of that nature. And he would be the one on the scene to take the pictures. And he was an entrepreneur as well. Come from a family of entrepreneurs. And I just remember like, you know, the opportunities and the flexibility that my father had drive me to school in downtown Philadelphia. I'm originally from Philly. Um, and, you know, I'd drive and I'd see these large, you know, buildings being constructed. And, you know, I didn't say this, you know, initially, but I actually worked in commercial real estate uh, before I went to business school. And that was kind of where my passion was fueled by my dad driving me to, you know, to to um, to elementary school. But I was always passing these large buildings in downtown Philly. And the reason why I bring that up is for you know for the opportunity of knowing that i can have that kind of flexibility for my family for my son you know i have a, a six-year-old and you know being able to travel you know have those opportunities to just live life um you know you know i don't know if you want to call it financially free you know necessarily but <laughs> um you know just knowing that i can like take off and or grab a lunch date with my wife or, you know, take off two days because I want to go to Disney World or Disneyland with my son. You know, it's huge. And, you know, part of it has been, you know, fueled by, you know, the sort of the, the experience that my, that my mother and my father created for our family. And, you know, I just always knew that, you know, I would have a business. I didn't know in what capacity. I also knew sort of the opportunities that it afforded. And that's really what drove me into you know being an entrepreneur in some capacity nice. all right you mentioned that date with the wife so what was your most memorable date with your wife oh my goodness man you put me on the spot we've been in so many different dates um <laughs> i'd say the most recent one is i mean i call it a longer date but my wife and i you know she surprised me we flew to uh, las vegas this year for father's day trip and uh oh my goodness it was just us you know had a babysitter you know here taking care of the little rascal and uh, we went to so many different spots, went to some shows, you know, had great food. I think it's probably the most I've ever eaten in my life. Um, it was an absolute blast. That's the one, the mem most memorable one that comes to mind. <laughs> uh, but we're usually going on a lot of different lunch dates and, you know, regular dates and whatnot, just to, you know, got to get that quality time. And for those, you know, men and women that are out there, that quality time I'm telling you it's critical. Got to keep, got to keep doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think, one of the advantages of, of being an entrepreneur is the investment that you can make in your family and, and designing a business that supports the lifestyle that you want um, yeah. is, is a benefit that many entrepreneurs aren't taking because they've just started a business and then the business takes over their life rather right. than being able to design the life that they want and then build the business to support it. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's, I know that for some people out there that you may feel like you have to be working you know, from 5 a.m. in the morning to, you know, 10 p.m. at night. Um, and you have to do it every day. And there are certain times when you may feel that way, like there's certain sprints within your company where you kind of just need to kind of get after it. But, you know, life is short, man. Um, and I know it also depends on where everyone is financially and whatnot. But, you know, you, you got to be able to take those breaks. You know, I know mm -hmm. too many smart, you know, too many, you know, great entrepreneurs out here you know, who, you know, they turn 55, 60 and they got a, a pile of cash, but, you know, not a lot of time that's been invested within their family or memories that they can say that they really appreciate. Um, and so, you know, there was a period of time where I was, you know, you know, burning a lot of a lot of that midnight oil, but I was still spending more quality time with the family. And now I really try to spend a lot more quality time. I typically shut down at 530 um, and then I'm up at five. 530 usually and I just kind of I'm just pretty efficient in in my time and you know whatever I don't finish I don't finish unless it's a project that I got to finish the next day and it's critical other than that you know that's that's sort of how I try to operate nice and well, so far it's worked out <laughs> nice so you mentioned uh, routines what other what other routines have helped you grow as a businessman grow as a leader yeah, you know, I'm a, I, I try to read, um, you know, as often as I can, I'm really just trying to stay up to date on best practices within our industry. 
Um, you know, I, I, I like to do speaking engagements and webinars. So, cause it forces me to, you know, be sharp, <laughs> kind of like you put yourself out there. It's like, all right, I really need to deliver. So I need to be on top of what's going on type of thing. Um, other routine, I'm usually up in the mornings pretty early. So I usually get a good workout in about 45 minutes. That's something that's a pretty a staple four to five days a week. Um, you know, again, life is short, so you have to take care of yourself, not just your mind, but also your body. Uh, so that's critical, usually up at 530. Um, I don't work out if I used to, but now I, I work from 530 to about seven, get my little guy ready for um, school, get some time with him. Once I get him him squared, you know, that's when I get my workout in. I'm usually working from like nine o'clock until five thirty, usually. Um, every once in a while I take a lunch break. Sometimes I just keep plugging away. Just the nature of the business that we're in. Five thirty max, that's when I shut down. Um, and that's that's pretty standard every day, Monday nice. through Friday. And every once in a while I might have to do an hour's worth of work on a Saturday, but that's about it. Nice. So with all the business success you've had, what's what's your biggest challenge today? You know, I'd say the biggest challenge right now is managing people and trying to make sure that I'm being the best leader mm -hmm. to instill wisdom and best practices uh, from an operational excellence standpoint for my team. You know, I think my team is great. Um, I always have to just remind myself that not everybody is me. I mean, we say it differently. Nobody's me and I'm not everybody else, essentially. And, you know, as a leader, you, you may feel like you have to do everything for everyone. And that's the part that I'm learning to do a better job with while at the same time instilling wisdom, instilling best practices from just a communication perspective, knowing that in the world of management, management is really about repeating yourself over and over again. A lot of people think that you can just say some, something once and everyone catches it. And no, you, you're going to have to repeat yourself like five, six times <laughs> and be OK with that and not get frustrated. Um, and so that's been a little bit of a challenge. But, you know, I think the, the, the key initially is making certain that you hire great people that, you know, has sort of the, you know, that proactive spirit about themselves where they want to both get better and they want to see the company get better. and They just want to do great work. If you have that as the bedrock and someone has like good outgoing, good communication, you're going to put yourself in a good spot. But you always have to set aside time to bring value to your employees and to the people that, you know, look up to you or else, you know, you know, there's, there's you, you just put yourself in a tougher position long term. So that's been a challenge, but it's something that we're working on and we're getting a lot better in as well. Nice. All right, Justin, what inspires you? Oh man, uh, you know certainly my my faith, but you know you know next next on that list would would be my you know my family, you know just you know I don't, I don't know if I want to call it just this you know concept of generational wealth. I mean yeah that that all sounds that was fine and good, but you know you know wealth can be you know looked at as like the time that you get with your family, um, and you know you know I do think about what my mother and father did for me, and sort of you know leaving a legacy you know, for both my wife and my, my son, my family in, in, in the future. But, you know, I'd say it's definitely the family uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that, you know, Ellis, um, E-L-L-I-S is, is the name of my son, making certain that he's in an incredible place, you know, mentally and physically, of course. And, you know, he'll be able to do a lot of things that he wants to do, you know, once he turns 18, because once he's 18, I'll still be his dad, but he'll be his own man at that point. So just make a certain that he's at a good spot when he reaches that age. Nice. Yeah, it's always good to set him up and get him out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta get him set up, but you gotta, gotta go fly, buddy. Time to fly. Nice. All right. You mentioned your faith, you, you, and obviously you've been on this personal growth journey as as a, as a leader, as a as a husband, as a as a man. And how how has gratitude helped you and, and served you? gratitude um you know i feel like it served me quite a bit you know I, I i it's it's kind of a different context i'd say that you know gratitude works hand in hand with humbleness mm. like having an appreciation for you know where you are as a leader and not taking it for granted not boasting about it not you know 
you know, saying that, oh, I'm this flossy guy with the Lamborghini and I got my, you know, my iPhone and I'm, you know, taking all this video of look at me in front of my, you know, my car. And, you know, that's fine, you know, because that, again, is the facade versus the avatar that you're trying to attract and trying to sell, you know, but again, you kind of need to be true to yourself and, and have a, a sense of gratitude and humbleness, you know, about both yourself and also the people around you in your life in general. And I am incredibly grateful for, you know, you know, sort of my upbringing and kind of where I've gotten the company along with my partners and, you know, the team just now, but I'm also humbled by the journey and what else is in store for us over the next, you know, five years. Um, you know, I just know too many people who, when they kind of build a company and, you know, everyone's probably grateful, you know, have a sense of gratitude, but, you know, they don't think about, you know, how they're giving back. They don't think about how they treat people. You know, they just have a, a mindset that, you know, I may not always agree with. Um, so I try to take, you know, certainly gratitude for sure, but, you know, in a different context, having that humble spirit about yourself, mm. um, you know, so that when you're communicating with folks, you always know that you're not your best self. You're always trying to get better. You're always appreciative of everyone that's around you, you know, not getting on people because, you know, not everyone's perfect. You know, it's that sense of gratitude of how you're bringing value, but how everybody's getting better around you. That's how I look at, you know, the term gratitude, but, you know, really being humble, you know, nice. more than anything else. So you mentioned, you mentioned giving back and, and contribution and how has giving back and contribution been a part of, of your business journey? Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, I'll be honest here. That's something that I definitely need to do more of. Um, you know, we are setting up some some programs here at Propellant Media where we're starting to do more community service driven uh, activities. Um, you know, for me, it's like over the last five years, it's probably the one area that I haven't done as much and that I should. But um, I try to look at the value that I bring around my knowledge, around my perspective to both my team, you know, our clients, our customers that do reach out to us. And look at it, you know, from that perspective, there are certain folks that I do mentor, um, of course. Um, but, you know, the giving back part is is, is vital because uh, you want to feel like you are doing something beyond just yourself, beyond it being a profit driven motive. Um, and profit driven is, is, is good. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But, you know, knowing that you have other people outside of your company that you're, you know, looking to give back to or bring value to or a certain initiative that's critical, you know, that is something that that has been on my mind and that we've, you know, actually set up recently. And so we're getting get to that more often, but that's my perspective on that. Nice. All right, Justin, what's what's your big dream? Oh man, my big dream. That's that's a tough one. Um you know, I don't want to say that like it's like to have this pile of money and to retire because um, I really don't foresee myself for retiring, you know, to like I'm like 60 or so. Um, I just feel like I need to kind of be in the game and be sharp and be doing something where I'm having a good time. Um, but my big dream is to, you know, you know, give back a, a huge chunk of money to my college at Morehouse, you know, maybe be an adjunct professor, you know, in the digital space you know, you know, have a nonprofit that's having some impact around the world in certain communities that I have an appreciation for sure that my family and my son is set up um, in a great way. And uh, just living a life of, of fulfillment and joy um, and, and happiness uh, more than anything else and freedom and having the option to do things that's, that's critical to me and my family. Um, and I feel like if we're doing that, and if I'm doing that, you know, that's 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 the biggest dream that I could live, you know, quite oh, honestly. That's so good, Justin. All right, Justin. So we've spent the last 35 minutes with these entrepreneurs and we're going to leave them with Justin's words of wisdom. What would you share? Uh, words of wisdom for your business. If you're an entrepreneur, two things. Always think about how you're going to bring value to the customer before they become a customer. Get on a whiteboard, write down all the types of stuff. Maybe it's calculators, webinars, maybe it's video content, maybe it's tools, ebooks, whatever, but that's vital. And number two, don't worry about building out the best website in the world, but make your website deep enough to where you are differentiated from the rest of your competition. Don't, you know, have it be a thin site. If you do those things, you are building an incredible foundation for future success for your company.
Well, Justin, thank you so much for hanging out today and sharing your story and, and uh, just uh, educating us on digital marketing and, and your journey. So I appreciate you. Yeah, no, I definitely appreciate it as well. Thanks so much, Robert. Absolute pleasure. This episode is brought to you by intentional decisions that lead to massive success. No, those aren't companies promoting our show. They are qualities that you need to build your business and take control of your life. So to help you out, I'm offering my most popular worksheets to help you plan the future you want and audit your calendar today. The best way to get what you want is to know what it is and start making sure that your calendar matches. You can download them free today at addvaluemindset.com. If you will take action by just completing these two activities, they will change your life and business. I promise you a new level of results in the coming year. The problem is that we make things so complicated and we lose focus on what is really important. These tools will help you refocus on what matters most. When you align your passion with your purpose in your work, you can be happier and start doing the things you wanted to in the first place, like spending more quality time with the kids. To get your free copy of the tools to start tackling your busy schedule, go to addvaluemindset.com. If you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, leave a review. But most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone who needs to hear it. Share, share, share. In our next episode, Kyle Yacoub and Robert talk about value creation at multiple levels. What does it mean for a company to truly add value, not just for their clients, but primarily for their employees, their team? And if you add value to your team, they will naturally add value to your clients.